Guantanamo Bay detention camp on the southern coast of Cuba, 700 miles from the United States. Built in 2002, the American military prison, also known as Gitmo, has detained nearly 800 alleged terrorists. This notorious site has made national headlines for its classified operations and the dangerous criminals it holds. But what many Americans may not realize is that there are other prisons. Prisons located on U.S. soil that harbor government secrets and contain criminals just as terrifying as those in Guantanamo. The very most secret prisons, I, I would say, are uh, super high security, super max prisons. The prisons where prisoners are in their cells, locked behind a solid steel door for 23 or 24 hours a day. Those are the most out of sight parts of our criminal justice system. Florence, Colorado. Hidden amidst the scenic Rocky Mountains lies the $60 million Administrative Maximum Facility, or ADX. Built in 1994, many believe the so-called Supermax is the most secure prison in the United States, and possibly even the world. There's only been three Supermax prisons in history, federal Supermax prisons, Alcatraz, Marion, Illinois, and now the current one. I've worked the prison beat for 23 years, and Supermax is by far the most elite of the prisons. It really is very secretive. It's been called the Harvard of prisons. The inmates that are at the current Supermax facility, they killed officers, they killed other inmates. They're going to the worst of the worst. Out of the 200 inmates in the federal system, the Supermax can only hold 490. It's not even full. You have to earn the right. Inmates consider themselves to be very important people, and they've earned this. It's a, it's a, a status symbol for them. Being in a Supermax prison makes them feel very special in a way. The Supermax just over 100 miles south of Denver, is often also referred to as a clean version of hell and the Alcatraz of the Rockies. As you get closer to the prison, you realize there's six gun towers, an abundance of razor wire, mobile patrols, armed officers in those vehicles driving around. Let's be candid here. It's the most secure facility in the United States. Prisoners at the Supermax are so high profile and so dangerous that their transportation into the facility warrants extra measures to ensure they do not escape. During those transports, it could be everything from a Black Hawk helicopter to chartered planes. There are all kinds of shackles, leg irons and belly chains, sometimes electronic devices. So if they move and try to escape, you can provide them a charge. I can't tell you the specifics about how many people are supervising those moves, but they're high level. There are helicopter deterrence systems. If you try to fly over with a helicopter to extract someone from the little yard that they have in the center of the prison, there are several layers of cables that crisscross over the yard. So nothing's getting out, nothing's getting in. According to insiders, the technology at the Supermax surpasses that of any federal prison before it making any attempt to escape futile. There are motion sensors in the floor. If anyone managed to work their way into the piping or the ducts in the building, a motion sensor would set off an alarm and the officers would know exactly where this was happening. The other thing about Supermax is the master control system is located where the inmates would never be able to get to it. But 
just in case there is an alarm they can set off that will shut down the master control and it's taken over at a remote location very far away from the prison. Notorious terrorists such as Ramsey Youssef, Richard Reed, Ted Kaczynski, and Eric Rudolph call the Supermax home. If you look down the typical cell block, or the range we call them, you would see Sammy the Bull Gravano, hitman for the Mafia, sitting next door a person like Robert Hansen, a spy, adjacent to, at one time, Timothy McVeigh, before his execution. The cost of housing inmates in solitary confinement is estimated to be $75,000 per inmate per year. But don't let that price fool you. Although the Supermax may appear to be a high-tech facility, this is no luxury hotel. There's nothing fancy. They have a cement bed with a very small mattress on it. There's a desk, but it's a solid cement desk. Even the chair is solid cement. They have a window, but the difference is a four-inch slit window as you're peeking out. You're not looking at the Rockies. You're simply looking at perhaps the backside of another building. You know, we give the inmates beyond that, the basics of toothpaste, toothbrush, a couple pairs of the underwear and, and the uniform. Believe it or not, the Supermax is more than a holding pen for some of the world's most notorious criminal minds. It also serves another, more secret function. One that is considered crucial. 2010, former prisoner Edward Kenjakowski committed suicide. Friends and family say it was the life-altering experiences in juvenile detention that haunted him and ultimately sent him to his grave. On August 11th, 2011, Judge Mark Chivarella was sentenced to 28 years in jail for 12 counts that included racketeering and conspiracy. My kid's not here, he's dead! He is a man! You remember me? Do you remember me? Do you remember my son? An all-star wrestler? He's gone, he shot his son in the heart! Oh. September 23, 2011, Judge Michael Conahan was sentenced to 17 and a half years in federal prison after he also pled guilty to racketeering and conspiracy. But was this kids for cash scandal an isolated incident? Or might it be just the tip of the iceberg, suggesting even more profitable secret prison agendas? August 14th, 2013, The Economist reports that the United States, a country made up of only 5% of the global population, actually imprisons 25% of the world's inmates. And shockingly, about one in every 107 Americans is incarcerated. The prison population in the United States has surged 30% in the last decade alone. The United States has the largest prison population in the world, more than China that has over a billion people. But why? Are there so many people incarcerated in the United States? Members of the legislature make themselves look like they were tough on crime for their constituents, so they started increasing sentences for various crimes. Then we invented the three-strike law. The war on drugs increased the federal prison population tremendously. Some suggest that the privatization of prisons is also one of the driving forces behind the staggering rise in incarceration rates in the United States. The private prisons began, oh, I guess maybe 30, 40 years ago. Corrections Corporation of America started with just a handful of people that believed that they could make some money with incarcerating uh, people in, in a private setting. And they started small with city jails and county jails. Then they grew and grew and grew. 
Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, is the nation's largest for-profit prison company. They operate over 60 correctional facilities nationwide. They have about uh, 90,000 correctional bed space, and they took in around $1.7 billion in gross revenue last year. In the public sector, prisons, you're basically a number. In the private prisons, you're a number with a dollar sign in front of it. Our governors made deals with the private corporations. Can citizens ever be sure prisons are operating in the best interest of the public? 95% of all prisoners will one day get out. These prisoners who are incarcerated in these for-profit prisons, which have no incentive to rehabilitate anyone, because if prisoners don't come back, well, that's just another dollar not in their pocket. When they get out, they tend to commit more crimes. That's what the research shows. That is really the danger to the public. But while some may see America's prisons for profit system as frightening, there is another, perhaps even more terrifying concern. That virtually anyone can end up behind bars and for no reason other than a case of mistaken identity. June 5th, 2007. Hector Velos, a United States citizen and lifelong resident of California, is preparing for his release from a state prison after serving six months for receiving stolen property. But just as he thinks he is being free, Velos is told that he will not be going home as planned. As we were being processed for release, uh, myself and probably about four other uh, inmates were held back only to be told that I was going to be processed for deportation. It's the greatest insult when someone tells you to your face that you're not an American citizen. Bello says he was then transferred to an unmarked processing site in Bakersfield, California, run by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, and the Department of Homeland Security. Your transfer facility for ICE, it just looks like a building, a station. There's no formal signs as you're walking in or anything that tell you you're actually in care or custody of ICE officials. According to other insiders, the secret location is just one of more than 180 sites known as field offices or processing facilities being hidden from the American public. We're right in downtown Los Angeles. Behind me is the federal building, and this is the front entrance, but you'd never know that underneath it is a hidden prison. So when someone's standing in the federal building, or even on the sidewalk, there are literally underneath your feet people in a prison being held by the Department of Homeland Security. Is the U.S. government really detaining immigrants, even American citizens, and hiding them in plain sight? Seeing this driveway here and being L.A., you think it was a parking lot. Uh, but actually, if you go down there, that is the entrance into an underground detention center where the Department of Homeland Security prisons immigrants while it processes them to be sent to other locations for detention. Although covert processing centers are meant for short-term stays, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, there are those who claim these centers actually detain people for days, weeks, and even months at a time. There were people who spent literally several weeks without brushing their teeth, changing their clothing, showering, uh, without being able to make a phone call. And when you have 50 people using one or two toilets, you can imagine what that's like. After two days spent in a holding cell, Hector Bellos says he was flown to Eloy, Arizona and locked up in an ICE detention facility. There, he spent two weeks behind bars before he could even see a judge to plea for his freedom. They 
submit my parents' birth certificates and my birth certificates, and I think with all the birth certificates, it should pretty much clear it up. And it doesn't. Some people spend years and years in prison, and you hear those stories all the time. Mistaken identity, bad witnesses. Those things happen, and it takes years to unravel them. So, you know, that happens. The system will make mistakes. Even after Bellows submitted his birth certificate, legal briefs he prepared himself, and a court appearance by his father, a decorated Vietnam War veteran, it still took 13 months before he was finally recognized as a U.S. citizen and set free. The government picked this guy up, put him in jail for over a year. Sorry, this doesn't happen in America. Oh, wait a minute, yeah, it does. I can't imagine what he was thinking sitting there. I mean, it's, it's the stuff of nightmares. It is estimated that Velosa's detention cost U.S. taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars to house him. And Velos is just one of hundreds of American citizens wrongfully detained. Reportedly, there were roughly 800 U.S. citizens in ICE detention between 2008 and 2012. But why? Critics believe that private prison corporations have been driving the country's immigration policy. They believe that they are lobbying for policies that will lock up more immigrants. About half of all immigrants who are detained by the federal government are housed in private prisons. It makes you wonder who's on the payroll, who's really gaining from this. I didn't. But while hundreds of U.S. citizens are wrongly detained in federal immigration facilities, there are those who believe there now exists a growing number of other equally insidious secret prisons. Facilities which appear to be benign, but whose secret purpose may pose the ultimate threat to America's freedoms. New Orleans, Louisiana, August 29, 2005. Hurricane Katrina destroys everything in its path, including local and state prisons. A state of emergency is declared, which many believe is a de facto form of martial law. FEMA. The Federal Emergency Management Agency mobilizes camps for the displaced. And state and federal authorities transform a Greyhound bus station into a makeshift jail, aptly named Camp Greyhound. We saw Hurricane Katrina and how many people got displaced as a result of that. There's a legitimate need for the federal government to have a contingency plan in the event of a disaster. Brigantine, New Jersey, October 29th, 2012. Hurricane Sandy wipes out thousands of homes in New York and New Jersey. 45,000 National Guard and Air Force personnel are deployed to over seven states to respond to the emergency. As with Katrina, tens of thousands of residents are left homeless. And once again, as they had after Katrina, FEMA sets up temporary encampments to house the victims in tents and trailers. But although few could argue why such an extraordinary disaster should require such an equally extraordinary response, there are many who claim these refugee sites operated more like prisons than shelters. And that, they believe, was no accident. They had them confined, they were feeding them. They were providing a bed and an environment to live in. The camps had to have security. You're taking in thousands of people and, and you don't know anything about those individuals. Some could be criminals. They've committed murders that are doing drugs. 
So you have to provide that balance of security because it's an unknown. These FEMA camps that spring up after something like a hurricane, right? You've lost everything. And when you go to a FEMA camp, they tell you, you're not allowed to talk to the media. Did you know that? Why? While it's responsible for government to provide for catastrophe response or for a national emergency, the problem is the characteristics of a FEMA camp is that the fences have razor wire or barbed wire that's pointing inward, meaning that it's meant to keep people in, not keep people out. Could the military-like tactics used in running FEMA camps really be serving as a type of dry run? One that is being orchestrated to serve another, more secret agenda? There has been a long discussion over the possibility that the U.S. government is making contingency plans to deal with a mass civil uprising. And it centers on certain facilities which are in existence, which are empty, and which appear to be very rapidly convertible to hold large numbers of human beings. The government doesn't call them FEMA camps. They call them emergency centers. They call it the civilian inmate labor camp program. They call it continuity of government emergency relocation centers. Some fear that FEMA camps could signal a return to a troubling period of American history when Japanese American citizens were rounded up, forced to leave their homes and businesses, and placed in detention camps during World War II. You can't rule out the fact that internment camps could rear their ugly head in the United States again. And I say again. They've happened before. It could happen again. Heron, Illinois. Cancer survivor Lisa Lindsay is arrested and jailed for failing to pay a $280 medical bill. But according to Lindsay, the bill is not hers. In fact, her name was erroneously attached to the debt by a collection agency. Lindsay ends up paying $600 to settle the mistaken charges and to get out of what some call a debtor's prison. Debtor's prison refers to the practice of jailing a person because he or she can't afford uh, to pay a fine. Might be a very small fine. There are thousands of inmates in jails and in prisons across this country that are there because they can't afford to pay their bills. The Supreme Court ruled more than 30 years ago that it's unconstitutional to jail someone for failure to pay a fine unless uh, the court specifically finds the person could pay but is choosing not to. In other words, you're not supposed to be jailed just because you're poor. Debtor's prisons were outlawed in the United States nearly 200 years ago. So how could they possibly exist today? People being jailed for debt tends to happen in municipal courts, in cases where people don't have a lawyer, and so it sort of flies under the radar. And it's a population that's, by definition, poor, uh, doesn't have political power, doesn't have influence, doesn't get a lot of media attention. A person who's arrested for having to pay speeding tickets and hasn't paid them, and then is put into a jail, put into a cell with a couple of rapists, the trauma can be truly severe. Um, and it can be very terrorizing to a person. But sometimes in jails, because of overcrowding, they'll put them in with people who have vile tendencies. And so we have seen people who have been assaulted. Could it really be that easy for people to be locked up due to clerical errors or simply a few missed payments? And if this can happen to any American, should the public pay closer attention to how our prison system operates and what secrets it may be hiding?
everyone can see what's happening within those institutions. And it's like they want to get to the edge and look over the cliff and see what's in there, but they don't want to really jump. Because once you go behind closed doors, no one knows what happens to you. Citizens jailed for minor debt and mistaken identity. Juveniles locked away for years at a time. And Americans wrongfully imprisoned for alleged immigration violations. Is the American prison system expanding so much that it could soon be detaining citizens for any reason at all? And all in the name of national security. It's conditioning. That's exactly what it's for. But what are they conditioning us for? Is it economic? Could it be some sort of natural disaster, an earthquake? It could be any one of those things. But you can say beyond the shadow of a doubt that they're preparing for something. I've been in some of the protests with the cops dressed up like stormtroopers out of Star Wars. If Americans rose up, they have the camps ready for us. They have the prisons ready for us. These are warehouses for humanity. These are warehouses for the American public. The public has really very little idea of what's happening behind the walls of America's prisons. No one can deny it. The land of the free, the home of the brave, has the largest prison population in the world, and it's only growing. Most people think of prisoners as the other. The reality is, with the largest prison population in the world, a lot of Americans are going to end up in prison or at least in jail at some point in their lives. It might be you, it might be your son or daughter, it might be a friend. We should all care what happens in prisons because that could be you or me or any of us. Should all U.S. citizens, even the law-abiding, be concerned about America's so-called secret prisons? There are those who believe the answer is a profound yes. But one thing is certain. Until the nation knows the truth about its prisons, thousands of Americans will continue asking questions and fearing the unknown while others will simply turn their heads and say, it can't happen here. They stand before us.